Okay, hello Ethics. Um, we are coming up on your first test, uh, Phil 103, section test number one, um, which you have access today and you've got until Tuesday, October 4th by noon um, in order to, to, to work on. So it's my advice is just chip away at it, right, as, as you go. Um, I'm recording this video for three sections of this, one of which is online, so um, I am going to make reference to video material. Um, my videos on um, both Socrates and Aristotle are also required, right? So I've just printed the copy of the, 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 the test um, for my own campus collect, uh, uh, class as well. But nonetheless, you're expected to watch the video material for this class. It's just like you're expected to show up for class, right? You're responsible for what's said in class. So, um, I start these tests off with a bunch of boilerplate. These, this, these are policies taken from the course syllabus. Um, that just, just so that you know what a section test is and what the relevant policies are. Um, that relate to it um, are, right? So, uh, course is divided into three sections consisting of two, uh, two theorists each. Each of the tests for this course will test only the section we're working on. That is, um, your third test won't engage Socrates again, right? Um, at least not directly. And so they're not comprehensive. Each test will consist of questions totaling 20 possible points, typically five short answer questions, which is what you get here, uh, and one longer answer question. Um, questions will be designed to test both reading comprehension and a more general understanding of the ideas that we've studied. That is, the readings, all of the video material are all fair game for these, any of our uh, in-class discussions, etc. Um, th these tests will be posted to Moodle at the end of each section covered by the quiz um, and on the syllabus I indicate the dates. Uh, you will have at least five days to engage with this test material. Your responses um, should be submitted through Moodle. No late assignments um, will be accepted. Um, with regard to that last, the no late assignments thing, there's an important um, a caveat there. You will find me very willing to work with you if life happens. I, I get it. There are life events um, that, 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 that they get in the way of your academic or work kind of obligations, right? So if you're sick, I'm not expecting you to, 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 to sort of suck it up. If you get injured, for example, in a car accident or fall down some stairs, right? If a uh, family member is sick and you wind up having to take care of them, um, if, if, if the sky falls, basically, right? Um, at one point, I know I took some time because my cat had to be put down. So, um, it, yeah, I'm in no shape to teach the next day, just like you should be in no shape to take a test. I get it. Life happens, right? The only thing that I want you to do is work with me if life happens. Hey, professor, if, I, if, if you're not going to be able to meet the deadline, I'm not going to be able to meet this deadline. This is the situation. Uh, can we work something out? Because an extension requires a conversation. It's a negotiation. All right. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I've seen some bizarre excuses and some unacceptable excuses for this. And it's like I was out partying very late with my friends and didn't get around to uh, the material. Well, that's blameworthy. And um, I'm sorry, I can't offer you an extension for that reason. But right, if if the sky falls, let me know either before the deadline or within 12 hours of it. Otherwise, I won't be able to offer an extension. The idea is don't wait three weeks and say, hey, I need to write this test because it's done. It's gone. I post a model answer. I'm on to grading these things. I've got to get these back because you want feedback in this course. You need feedback. You deserve feedback. So um, when I grant extensions, I hold off on grading and releasing grades and releasing a, a, an answer key until I have all of the assignments I'm going to get, right? So um, it, that's that's why the policy, right? Um, assignment submission, uh, it's your responsibility to make sure that you've properly uploaded your file, that you've uploaded your file, and that you've uploaded the right file to Moodle. Um, if frequently, I have students uh, submit me homework for other class as the 
the, the, the assignment for this class. Well, those responses aren't to these questions and I don't have your assignment. Frequently I have students say, I thought I submitted. Well, make sure you submit it. Because if you think you submitted and you didn't ex uh, submit, I don't, I don't have it, right? Um, uh, there are a lot of you, and I can't go chasing after each and every one of you. And frank uh, frankly, frequently in these courses, I have students that just kind of disappear, right? So if I'm not getting a response from you, I figure you're either planning to drop or just kind of ghosting on the class, right? So these things happen, I suppose, but I don't chase after you, right? Um, it's not my role. I take the work that you've submitted to me and I, I assess it and I, I spend a lot of time actually issuing comments and reflecting and reading your work, that sort of thing. But um, the additional time chasing after you for it, um, that's, that's, that's not my responsibility, it's your responsibility, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, one last thing about policies, there's a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. I know because you've got your books, it's essentially open book. You're typing on your computer, it's the easiest thing to open a web browser and Google Plato's uh, Phaedrus or uh, Socrates' Apology or Aristotle Nicomachean Ethics Book 1 and read a summary. Right? Um, but if you're using those ideas or you know, those words, more importantly, in your response, you need to tell me you're doing so. Largely, I tend to think that you should be able to write these these tests on the basis of what you've taken from the course material, just as it is. I think I've given you some pretty good course material. There, There's video content, there's um, that sort of thing. So, like, really, the easiest way to engage with these tests and probably the best in terms of what I'm looking for in terms of your responses is for you to just think about these questions, go back, reread the material, think about it some more, and type out your response. Now, if you're saying that Socrates in the Apology claims, tell me where in the Apology because I need to be able to go find that, especially if you're using it as evidence of something, right? If it's a contentious claim, I should be able to go find it. I know these political debates don't do that. And you see, the reason academics require you to say, I heard this on this date from this source is so that you don't get this, this wishy-wishy, I heard him say sometime, somewhere, and the other person saying, no, wrong, I didn't say that. Right. So, I mean, the easy way to actually solve a debate like that is to say October 9th in Newsweek 2015. Right? You said this. It's there for everybody to see. Or in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, Section 10 on page 11 of, or 12, or whatever section 10 is, section 10, book 1, Nicomachean Ethics, I'm guessing page 12 of your text. Yeah, let's test my memory. 10, 11, no, that's uh, section 9, uh, page 13, I was close, anyway. Um, he claims about the stability offered by virtues kind of thing, right? So, I mean, this is, this is, this is how you avoid uh, your reader, in this case me, calling bull, right? By saying, no, he clearly says that here. Okay, then we've got something to talk. Well, what does he mean by that? And then there's an interpretation that comes, right? So, anyhow, um, reference your work. Right. Uh, that's the idea. Um, one more word of caution. I've got like a spider sense for plagiarism. All of a sudden, it's just I'm reading something and it goes off. Right. Maybe it's like a Socratic daemon that, that right? plagiarist, plagiarist in my ear kind of thing. So then I check it. If you can find a source, I can find a source. So um, it stands out. It's like a sore thumb. It sticks out. Right. So um, don't do it. Um, penalty, penalties can be quite severe, and I tend to be a tough cop on this particular issue, only because. I want to know what you think. I don't want to know what Sparknotes thinks. I don't want to know what Wikipedia thinks, because in some cases, I'm the one who thinks on Wikipedia, right? It's funny, I actually contribute to Wikipedia, so every now and again, people plagiarize Wikipedia. I read it, and they're plagiarizing me. Right? No, no I, I said that, right? 
So um, it, you're best to just tell me what you think. Uh, that's that's what I'm trying to glean from these assignments anyway. So, readings, Plato's Five Dialogues, Apology and the Credo, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, 2, and 3, and remember uh, Section 3 is just uh, Book 3, Section 1, right? So it's like, what, two and a half pages of Book 3 that you're responsible for. I just want that one distinction, which I ask you a question about in here. Right. Um, video material, uh, the Roderick, Socrates, Video, Philosophy Guide to Happiness, Socrates on Self-Confidence, -conf Cool of Life, sorry, School of Life, uh, Philosophy, Aristotle, um, plus if you're in my online course, my videos on Socrates and Aristotle as well. So, part one, short answer questions. There are five of them, two points each, um, total of ten points, that's half your test. Um, uh, they require between three and five sentences for each response. I find students like a structure, so I suggest one. That is a rule of thumb. Um, if you offer me two sentences, you haven't offered me the minimum and can't get a passing grade. That's, that's the deal. If you offer me the bare minimum and um, it, 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 I'm telling you how to get a C, right? Every now and again, I come across, you know, one of those wonderfully concise writers who, in no uncertain terms in three sentences, has just nailed the response to this question, right? I consider that sort of an extraordinary sort of situation. I don't see it often, right? But it is possible to get a good grade with three sentence responses to these questions. Most of us, including me, who like to use examples or sort of circumlocute, that is, uh, circumlocution is around in a way about way of speaking, circumlocution, locution, speaking, circum, around it about. So um, if you're like me, you probably need more. Right? So um, this is what, two questions on Socrates, three on Aristotle. Question one, Socrates presents us with an epistemological, that is, theory of knowledge or way of knowing <laughs> position in which we're only able to make a negative claim to knowledge. For example, why is he the wisest man of Athens and what does it say about the status of human knowledge? Um, however, Socrates is able to make positive moral claims that stem from this ne negative claim, claim to knowledge. Discuss the intellectual movement from epistemology to ethics, which makes this possible. Um, for my online students, I, request, I recorded a whole video on this called Socrates' Moral Position. For my on-campus uh, students, uh, my YouTube name is G-R-A-N-T-Y-O-C-O-M. You can access that video. Um, it, it, so, Grant Yoakum Socrates, it's a whole playlist towards the end there, some more up-to-date videos, and it's there, right? So, um, nonetheless, you should have lots of resources to answer this question. This is sort of the key sort of ethics moment that I, I think is really clever in Socratic philosophy. So um, we spent a lot of in-class time on it. And like I say, for my online class, I recorded a specific video on this issue. All right. So um, two points. Why is Socrates the wisest man in Athens? How does this uh, relate to human knowledge generally? And where do the morals come from, from this negative claim to knowledge? Right. Um, so that's question one. Question two, um, even my intro class is answering this one, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, uh, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Define these notions and distinguish between them. So what social contract, what's tacit consent, how do they relate to one another? Remember, Socrates has a whole mechanism by which he's presenting you with the theory of justice, right? And um, he talks about agreement with the, the, between the citizen and state, a manner of agreeing, right? So I've just given you too much there. So that's question two, right? Um, question three, briefly discuss the function argument discussed by Aristotle in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, 
it, it, it's sort of a newish um, Aristotle set of videos on there. I think I've got old ones too, in which I, they're grainy and I discuss this and I, you see different hairstyles and stuff like that because they're old. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the newer video discusses the function argument. I consider this the linchpin of Aristotelian philosophy. This is how Aristotle's able to claim any of the other things that he's able to claim. Right? So it's the important argument. Um, so, um, it, 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 so it briefly discuss the function argument. Like, what's the function argument? I gave you lots of examples. Um, an example may be a good way to go about this. Right? How, by this argument, part two of the question, does Aristotle arrive at his definition of happiness? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, excuse me there. Right? Um, and remember, what is Aristotle's definition of happiness? You should perhaps bring up Aristotle's definition for happiness in this response. So, question on book one. Question four is a question on book two of the Nicomachean Ethics. In the Nicomachean Ethics, um, Aristotle defines virtue of character and discusses how it's developed. Define virtue of character and brief, briefly discuss how it's developed. What's virtue of character? How do we get it? All right, so that should be a very straightforward question for it. All right. Um, then question five, one on book three, section one of the Nicomachean Ethics. You see how this works? Uh, we studied the Apology. I asked you a question on the Apology. We studied the Credo. I asked you a question on the Credo. And then we discussed three books of Nic uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. There's a question on each of the books of the Nicomachean Ethics. So, in paragraph 13 of book 3 of the Nicomachean Ethics, um, section 1, right, um, <clears throat> Aristotle draws a distinction between what he calls non-voluntary and what he would call properly involuntary. How are these types of action distinct and, more importantly, why does Aristotle bother to make the distinction in the first place? Um, there is a wonderful footnote. All right, um, we'll test my memory again, page 227. No, not page two, uh, 203, all right, page 203 of the Nicomachean Ethics, right, that relates to the book three, section one, paragraph 13. It reads, for of someone's dot, 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 no pain, all right, where Aristotle or the commenter on Aristotle that um, put the explanatory notes in this version of the Nicomachean Ethics explains this distinction very clearly. So that's a very key footnote. If you're looking for it, like if for some reason you missed um, a class or didn't pay attention to that part, you're looking for an explanation. There it is, page 203 in a footnote. Right. So anyhow, um, that's after test. Now for the other half of the test, part two, longer answer questions. And I consider these sort of prep for um, your essay that is uh, your writing assignment, which is coming in at the end of the class, which essentially presents a general problematic and asks you to address it in terms of two theorists. So what I do is I give you a general problematic here and ask you to address it using the two theorists that we're discussing here. All right, so this is this is practice. This is a short version of what you're going to give me a long version of at the end of the class. So uh, longer air answer questions require between three and five paragraphs in response. So again, if you give me less than three paragraphs in a response, then um, you can't pass, right? Um, and um, it's, I'm referring to paragraphs and sentences because I need full sentences for your responses to each of these questions. A paragraph consists of a minimum of three sentences. So um, the thing about minimums is if you give me the minimum, I'm telling you how to barely pass, right? You're going to get a minimal grade, right? Now, a full answer to these questions, like I say, I don't know you yet. I don't know how you write, right? If you circumlocute like me, uh, I'd probably pl probably write a page and a half in response to a question like the one that I'm asking you here. That's just me, all right? 
But um, nonetheless, um, between three and five paragraphs is generally what I'm looking for. Uh, the goal of this section is to make a short argumentative account of the material at hand as directed by this question. So the question, in the Apology, it is clear that Socrates, by stressing the importance of moral reasoning, sets up a position in a way that opposes reasons to the emotions, right? Think about it, right? We should be persuaded not uh, by sympathies, not by um, emotional pleas, etc., etc., but only by the reasons in this argument. We should be persu persuaded by the, Roderick calls it, the unforced force of the better argument, right? So it's clear that that is what Socrates is doing in the Apology. Simply, we should be persuaded by reasons and not by emotionally grounded opinions or bare beliefs. Aristotle, on the other hand, discusses emotions extensively and incorporates our dispositions to our emotion into his account as the foundation of moral character. These two theorists have distinct estimations of the role of emotion for moral considerations. All right. So uh, the idea is briefly to introduce these positions, like uh, regarding how we relate to emotions, right? Followed by a brief comparative account of these positions. Right? Is Socrates right? And emotions are just bad. We should keep them over here and only be persuaded by reason. Uh, sort of the Spock from Star Trek argument, right? Or, right, is Aristotle sort of superior, where he acknowledges we have these emotions, and really the role of reason is to, in a sense, train us to react to this emotional landscape in a way that's appropriate, that's virtuous, that hits the intermediate condition that's moderate, right? So, um, th that is your goal, right? So, this is why I say three paragraphs. Here's Socrates, here's Aristotle, here's my analysis, minimally, right? It's, I couldn't see anyone answering this question doing less than that, right? These require paragraphs because you're on to a new ID in each, right? Whereas, um, if you're like me, now I'd illustrate these things with examples, right? It's, I'd pull an example out that, that, that problematizes both positions. I'd take a position and then I'd argue it. It'd probably take me five paragraphs in order to answer this question, if you're like me, right? There's no need to be like me. If you're very concise and can do this in a concise way, that's there, there's skill and merit to that. But nonetheless, um, so if you have any questions, um, over the weekend I'll be checking my email. Um, uh, for those of you with class meetings today, you can ask me questions in class, um, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, um, I look forward to reading your full sentence responses to these questions. And um, have good days, one for each of you. Take care.